Um, you know, I've been dealing with a lot of issues this week with myself and my family because of the illness. And um, I never had any doubt at all that God would, would see us through it because that, at the end of the day, um, we all just belong to God. So whatever occurs, whether good or bad, it, if it comes from God, it's going to be good. And there's a, a purpose for it all. But with that being said, you know, I understand that it's really difficult right now with all that we're dealing with um, on how to do life day to day. And it's easy to talk about it as a pastor, but it's another thing to experience it. And so today what I thought I would do is continue on in my series um, with the Bible text for the last days. And um, what I would like to do is continue on in the series um, by dealing with five Bible texts that actually help me deal with frustration. Um, so if you wonder, man, do pastors ever get frustrated? You have no idea. Pastors get frustrated a lot. And a lot of times frustration comes from a place that is within ourselves. If we are frustrated, it's because we have higher expectations than what God has for us. In other words, we move ahead of God and we don't really, we don't rely on God more. So me as a, as a, as a human, as a pastor, if I start to get frustrated, that's a, that's a true tell sign to me that I'm moving outside the will of God because God's will is always perfect and it provides peace. So when I'm not experiencing peace, that's normally um, a good indicator to me that something is coming from my own pride, my own arrogance or my own desires. Okay. So now when we have these ideas and these plans and then you say, well, Lord, I leave it to you. And then you say, well, whatever the outcome, it's going to be all good. Then you know that that is going to be blessed by God because God is going to take that and where your efforts fail, God's will will prevail. In other words, God will take that and he wants to see the desires of your heart um, go beyond what you think um, you can do. And this is where God likes to work is in the impossible. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about what do we do when we're dealing with frustration now. So what I'd like to do is share with you five texts this morning. And again, here's my presumption. My presumption is that there is going to come a time in our near future where you're not going to be able to access online Bibles on your phones or even on your computers. The Bible tells us, Jesus says in Matthew 24, that there will come a time of tribulation where it'll get so horrendous, so horrible that God's people will even have to flee. Now, when you, when you wrap your mind around that aspect about fleeing, you know, I've, I've talked to several members who are watching right now. Pastor, what do I do? I don't have the capability of fleeing. Well, when that time comes, God will make a way for you and there will be a place for you to go. But, you know, think about that. When you are fleeing, the only thing that you're going to have most likely is your bug out bag and the clothes on your back because Jesus is coming very imminent and your Bible. So the only thing that you're going to have with you is going to be this, your Bible. Okay. Now, if you do not have a Bible, you need to get a Bible. If you have a Bible, you need to start to read and mark the Bible up. By the way, I saw Sister Ashley Tetro. Welcome, guys. I'm glad you're on, online. Um, thank you for the prayers, by the way, for my family. She was going to help me do a Bible markup class. So as soon as we get the church open and I can get back in doing regular in-person programming, that's one of the programs that I would like to do as your pastor is arm you with using your Bible on how to um, how to provide hope and help during the time when you need it. You know, the Bible doesn't, it's not going to be helpful to you if you haven't read it or you haven't marked it up. So every week in the series, what I've been giving you are Bible texts that you can put in your liner notes here, and then you can, um, you can refer to it when you need it. So that way you have a quick reference. So here you see here um, that sermon I gave on 12 key verses for impatience during the end time. And I have all of my text here. This is really helpful. So that way you have that ready to go when you need it, um, especially during the times of trouble in the end times. I, I don't know what that end time is going to look like. Okay. But Jesus does. And Jesus told us what it might look like. And if you just add all of those factors and variables together in a formula and you come up with an end result, the end result is all of these things that we're dealing with, you should not be a victim to frustration or depression or, or helplessness or hopelessness. God's people has no business dealing with that because you already have the keys and the, and the answers. 
okay? But you just have to believe in what God told you. So I'm going to give you these texts, but you, but it's up to you to simulate and, and bring them into, you have to take it into who you are in your life. And you need to apply it to your where you are now, to your life. Because only then will you see the application of God's word, okay? And have, have trust that God is going to be with you to the very end, okay? Now, as we think about this, um, here, let me, let me go back. I'm talking about frustration, but, you know, the same text can deal with things like fear, um, joylessness, sadness, pain, anger. If you're feeling empty or low, if you feel like your whole life has been a failure, and you're dealing with depression, or you feel like your plans right now have been delayed, so you're frustrated, and maybe you're in a relationship, you know, now that you've had to spend more time with people, you, you discover that they're not who they thought, who you thought they were, and you feel rejected, and you feel lonely, and you feel at times um, like your, your relationships, as well as whatever you're dealing with, and maybe your careers or your businesses are failures, okay? But just remember, that there, we're, this is it's human to deal with all of these things, and God has an answer for this, okay? So let's talk a little bit about that. Now, what I like to do, as you can see here, this is um, the pop singer Selena Gomez. And for all of you um, high school and college students that are watching me right now, you know who Selena Gomez is. Those of you who don't know who she is, she was a Disney star. She's a big singer. And here's what she had to say some years ago. If you have three people in your life that you can trust, you can consider yourself the luckiest person in the whole world. Now, this is coming from a young person who could not trust anybody. She was in an industry that everyone wanted to use her. There's a lot of times when we feel like this. And if you can just find three people who you can trust implicitly, then she is saying that you are the luckiest person in the entire world. And this is the problem today. The problem today is... Um, it's a pro it's an issue of trust. We can't trust each other. It has turned so badly that now these are t-shirts that are going out. This is an actual t-shirt design. It says, keep it gangster and don't trust nobody. Okay. So the grammar is a little off there, but you get the message. So you're going to see a lot of people wearing this kind of t-shirt. They're going to be wearing, they're going to be flying these kind of flags. You're going to see these poster boards coming up here around November. They're saying keep it against gangster and don't trust nobody. Okay, they're they're actually referring to the government, the police. They're referring to the school systems. They're referring to your politicians, to your businesses, to um to the life of Americans. You know, so this lack of trust in this new generation and even for us today is becoming a very deep problem. Okay, and it's gotten so point to the point where this comes from the movie Vendetta. Um, this is the message that's going out to people in the colleges, to students who are trying to get degrees. They're saying, this is the message, drop out of college, live with your parents, watch V for Vendetta, which is a movie which talks about anarchy, listen to Rise Against, okay, read Nietzsche, which is, um, don't read Nietzsche, okay, <laughs> he's not good, buy a Guy Fa mask, eat organic, avoid anything mainstream, Preach anarchy and repeat after me, I am free. So the concept now, because we can't trust anyone, the concept of freedom is no longer based in law. It's no longer based in democracy or a place of principle or value. It's now um, placed in the thing. Since you can't trust anyone, just trust yourself, okay? And try to use as many people as you possibly can. So this is the new norm. This is, this is the direction that society is moving in. And it's an alarm to me because it is actually prophetic. Jesus says that the love of many will wax cold. And because of me and my name, many will be offended. There'll be many false Christs. In other words, there'll be people who are saying they found Jesus, but actually they have not found Jesus. And they're actually going to be working for Satan. Okay, so this is all in Matthew 24. And we see that this is the foundation of this new... The, a fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus was actually talking about that sets us up for the last days, okay? So what is the result of this new mindset? Police knock us down so they can feel tall, okay? Um, use your white privilege to dismantle the system. This is in Los Angeles, protests. And 
this this concept that you cannot trust anybody has now led to a frustration that has become violent and has now become to the point where it's difficult to create law and order, okay? And it seems like society is now wandering on a vast ocean without a port in sight. They don't have an anchor down and they're in a vast storm. And this is where the world feels at this time, okay? Well, God has an answer for that. The first text I like to bring to you is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. So write this one down. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 6 is very simple. God from above has said, if you can't trust anybody, that's fine. Trust in the Lord. Because if you trust in the Lord with all your heart, see, that's the key there. Because we say we trust in the Lord, but we really don't trust in the Lord. We say we trust in the Lord, but we doubt. And we're not sure what's going to happen by tonight. But here the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. In other words, believe it. Believe in what God says and just test him for a second. And lean not on your own understanding. In other words, if you can understand it, okay, God can't work. God likes to work in the impossible. So he says, if you lean on your understanding, you can try to understand it all. You're not going to understand it all. So he says, since you can't understand it all, and because you can't trust anyone, let's try something different. Let's change the formula now. How about trust in the Lord with all your heart? I mean, what do you got to lose? The whole world is going crazy anyways, right? You see it all failing everywhere. So obviously what we're doing is not correct. So how about we try a new formula? How about let's just trust in the Lord with all of our heart and let's not lean on what we think we can understand and let's just shoot for some impossibilities and let's see what God does with that. I'm, I'm good at that. I'm good at the impossible. I just say, Lord, here's what I want to do and then I'll just take an action and somehow two or three years later, I look back and say, wow, that was crazy. I could have never done that on my own. I know many of you know what I'm talking about in your own lives. But look at verse six. In all your ways, so it doesn't say in just some of your ways, because a lot of times we like to give our spiritual life to God, but we don't like to put our bank accounts in God's hands, or we don't like to put our jobs in God's hands, or this COVID-19 in God's hands, okay, or whatever it might be. It says here, in everything, in all your ways, you need to submit to God, and he will make that path straight. Now, if you look at this picture, this is not a straight path, but if I look at the end goal, I see a straight path. Sometimes God will take us on these winding roads to avoid some danger. We don't understand it. How many times have we been delayed on the freeway and we're so upset, we're so frustrated. I got to get to my appointment. I'm going to be five minutes late. And someone in the house is taking their sweet time. They have to use the restroom. Maybe they forgot their keys and you're just going crazy. And then you get on the freeway and you're driving like a crazy person because you want to get to your appointment. You're already going to be late and you're yelling at everyone. I told you guys to get ready, right? And then you come across an accident in the freeway. And you think about that and you say to yourself, if I would have left five minutes ago, I would have been in that accident. There was a reason why God delayed us. That path was not straight. He took me on a little detour. I was five minutes late, but I preserved my family. You know what I'm talking about because I've heard stories of people who can't understand why they're going through what they're going through. And yet, when you look back two or three years, you can say, ah, I understand now. God was trying to avoid this thing. Okay, here's the thing. You've got to trust in the Lord in all your heart, with all your heart. You, you can't lean on what you think you understand. You need to submit everything to God and trust that God is going to make your pathway straight. He has an interest in shooting you like a straight arrow as a trajectory to the bullseye. He doesn't want to deviate you unless there's a reason for it. And you have to trust in that. So here's the key. Don't be frustrated. Don't be frustrated because oftentimes we get frustrated because we put our own little values on time priority, on our management of how we're going to get things done in a certain way. Relax a little bit. Let God take control. Okay? If you find yourself being so frustrated, that's a good sign that you're having too much control. Not, you need to turn control over to God a little bit, okay? So that's the first text, Proverbs 3, chapter 5, verse 6. Okay, today, 
because of everything we're going through, we see broken families. You know, you see this with families that you know. People in our church have gone through this just in the last six months. Okay, you know, you have cousins and you have family members and you have neighbors and you're seeing families just separate because of crazy stuff that's going on in the world. Okay, and at the end of the day, that love that they shared is, is broken. Okay, what does God have to say? Okay, here's my second one. Psalm 34, verse 18. God says in Psalm, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. You know, when you think about who God is close to, you might think that, well, you know, he's really close to President Trump. He's close to the senators and he's close to all the rulers in the church because, you know, obviously they need to be directed in how things need to go. Did you know that actually if God had a choice and he were to be on the planet right now, you know where he would be? He would be in the hospitals. He'd be with the poor. He would be with those who are suffering from broken hearts. That's where you would find Jesus. OK, and it goes on and it says that God is not only close, but he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now, this is an amazing phrase, crushed in spirit. It's not hurt in spirit. It's not frustrated in spirit. We're not talking about those who have been offended in spirit. No, we're talking about those who are absolutely been crushed to smithereens. OK, we're talking about people who have no more hope. They've been so down that they're ready to. To themselves okay this is where God meets a person and it the bottom line is this a lot of frustration we deal with is this lack of forgiveness we don't have the humility to go to a person because we always want to be right we always want to have our point said it's like we always have to be in the upper hand how about let's change that formula a little bit if you're frustrated and say you know what will you forgive me now, you notice I use this picture because you notice the box marked X, uh, yes, is a nail that just went through the hand of Jesus. If Jesus was able to forgive you, then you, as God's child, need to learn how to forgive others. Most importantly, you need to learn how to forgive yourself. When you're feeling frustrated in life, when you're feeling depressed and you feel like things are just not going the way you want it to go, there's nothing like a broken family. It seems like everything is out of control. There's a lot of hurt feelings, broken dreams. There might be children involved. And it feels like things are in chaos. You're losing friends. You're losing family. You think like everyone is watching you. Okay, at the end of the day, you just need to turn that over to God. Know that God is close to you and your broken heart. And he's interested in saving you if you feel like you've been crushed. And remember, this is going to take some long time, and we're going to talk about a text that talks about this, but at the end of the day, you have to come to a place in your life through that frustration where you can say, will you forgive me? And more importantly, will you forgive yourself as you look in the mirror? And remember that the nail that went through Jesus's hand and his feet is marking the box yes, and there's some blood stains on that yes box. If Jesus was able to do it for you, then you should be able to do it for others. All right, Psalm 34, 18. Now, here's what it's like today, okay? Now, if you think, man, Pastor Ed and Sister Angela, they have the perfect life. They're just holy all the time. They're praying, you know, maybe the vision you have of my family is that we have light candles and we're all, and we're just like, um, and then we eat and then we come back. No, you know, that's not my family at all. My family, Angela is very exuberant. She's very energetic. She has opinions and she will not back down. And so this is what it's like. We often go through boxing matches with our tongues, okay, with our words, okay? I mean, I'm not literally going to, you know, like that, okay? This, this is symbolic. It's metaphorical. We use our words to cut each other down. Now, we don't do that, um, you know, we know when to stop in my family, but this is what it's like in most family, okay? This concept of, of just using your words and fighting each other. You get frustrated because you're not your point's not being heard or uh, there was a miscommunication. Did you know that's the number one reason for frustration and for a breakup and heartbreaks and for a divorce is communication. All right, this, this lack of um, dispute or conflict resolution. We don't know how to like get through it verbally, okay? So most of the, the failure happens in our words. It's in our discussion and our conversation. And it feels like we're just boxing each other. We're, we're like 
um, wrestlers or boxers or MMA fighters, and we just want to do a roundhouse kick to your face, and we just want to do an uppercut. We want to get our point heard, and we're using our words to do this, right? Okay. Then we say, okay, this is not going anywhere. So what do we do? Now we go to our iPhones, and then we go to our little pads and our computers, and we start sending super nasty emails and text messages, okay? And it's just as bad. You know, you said this, no, 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 I did not, you misunderstood, blah, blah, blah. and we go back and forth, and then all of a sudden we have all this text messaging and emails as, as proof for a divorce, okay? All right, here's the thing. How about we do this? James chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. This is my third text, all right? Sometimes we need to follow the biblical example. In other words, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Now, I like to use this as an example with my kids and with our family here in my house. As soon as we start going at each other and we start saying, well, I didn't say that, whatever, okay? I remember that God gave me two ears. That means I need to listen doubly more than what comes out of my one mouth, okay? Sometimes it feels like in life we have three mouths and one ear. You know what I'm saying, okay? And sometimes we have, we're completely blind. We don't even see what's going on. So imagine the person that has three mouths, one ear, and no eyes. That's just, this is how people are today. The Bible says this. Use two ears. Use minimal mouth. Use it only when you have to use it. You know, my dad used to also say, and I say to, to people in my church, maybe sometimes the best way of saying things is just yay, yay, and nay, nay. Okay. Sometimes saying little is better and just listen and open your two eyes to see the situation. Now, it's not just seeing visibly, but actually looking at a person's experiences and going through um, more than sympathy, but empathy, understanding what that person is going through. You know, there's members in our church. People don't even realize that their moms and their fathers just passed away. That's horrible. And then and then they're, they're asked questions at church and it's so insensitive. It's not only at church, but it happens in your families, it happens at work. You might be dealing with something, you just went through a death, and everyone's asking you about a report, and, and um, no one understands what's going on with you, okay? Well, as Christians, we have to remember that don't get too, too quick to anger or frustration, okay? Just stop for a minute, listen with two ears, don't say anything yet, open your eyes, okay? And do what God needs you to do. Be righteous. What is righteousness? Righteousness is be more of a listener, less of a speaker. Be more of an observer and don't move yourself into a place of frustration that leads to anger. Because anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires for you. Why is that? It's not because um, anger is like, ooh, bad. You know, it's because you put yourself in the place of God. Okay, if you humble yourself and allow yourself to allow God to reveal to you what's going on in that situation, then God can come in and he can start to combine his will, his eyesight, his mouth, his ears with yours. And that righteousness that God wants to convey in that situation can then move forward. Now, there's a lot of situations you're talking about budgets, how to raise kids, how to cook a meal cleaning the dog poop, whatever it might be that causes this frustration and anger. Okay, have a little patience, have a little understanding, be slow to anger and just chillax, okay? Just relax for a second and just see that maybe your kids and your wife or your husband could not do the things that you wanted them to do because they were dealing with something else, okay? So we just have to be a little bit slower in how we come to our conclusion. And this is what James is talking about. Control the tongue, open the ears and the eyes, and this will definitely diminish your frustration. Okay, now, this might be a familiar scene back in the Great Depression. This is um, along the Canadian border. There was great unemployment that people were starving. They wanted work. Um, look at that sign. Are we aliens? Give us wages. Um, Canada's homeless youth. Are they going to starve? Okay. So you say to yourself, wow, it's amazing how the world was dealing with this Great Depression. Okay, guess what? We're there. This is a picture that was just taken several um, days ago right here in Phoenix, Arizona. It's happening all around the nation. Sent home Tuesday, still no callback. They need work. 
no employment. So what we are seeing now, you might be frustrated because of what the pandemic has caused or the economic recession that is about ready to hit. OK, look at this. Back in the 1930s, you can get a free cup of coffee and a donut if you were unemployed. And look at that line just to get free soup or free um, donut and a free cup of coffee because you couldn't get it anywhere. OK, and you say, man, I'm so glad we're not there. We're way better now. All right. That was in the 1930s. We're 2020 now. We'll never see that again. Really? Take a look at this. That's happening around the nation. People in, in cars driving up to get food from food banks because they don't have food in their, their markets. OK, here's that line again. They need their free. They need their free um, donut. They need their free bread. OK, these long bread lines that were occurring all over the nation. OK, look at this picture. This is right in Chicago, in New York. People standing with their mask in line with their with their baskets to get food. OK, this is 2020 and we're dealing with the exact same thing as they were dealing with with 1930. And there was great hope, uh, um, helplessness, hopelessness, lots of frustration, a lot of anger. OK, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 36 is my next text. Write this one down. Here's the thing. You're going to see all this happen. All right. So don't think that it's not going to impact you because things will impact you. We know that Jesus says it, it's going to impact you so much that you might have to flee or you'll be persecuted. OK, so here's what Jesus says, though. In spite of that, don't throw away your confidence in God. Why would you allow things to occur in your life outside of you that would undermine and diminish your faith? Those are things that Satan is bringing on, not God. So that would be like blaming someone else for what someone else is doing. You know, someone is, is hurting me, so I'm going to yell at you. That doesn't make any sense. If Satan is attacking the country and Satan is attacking you and your family, why would you blame God? Put the blame where it belongs. That's Satan's problem. So here's what God says. If you're feeling frustrated and you're feeling angry and you feel like there's no hope, don't throw away your confidence because know that you're going to have a rich reward. If you remain true to your race, if you remain through, um, through that, you know, a marathon runner, they start out strong, but man, in that last leg, they feel like they're going to die. They want to pass out. Stay to it. Just keep your confidence. Just keep pursuing it and it will be richly rewarded. Look at verse 36. Persevere. That means patience. Be steadfast. Just keep your hand to the plow. You know, that saying um, comes from the old days when, um, so brother Derek, he talked this morning about planting. You know, when he was in Oregon, he loved to plant seeds and about 90 percent would come up and some seeds didn't come up. OK, back in the old days when they were planting, they would hold on to these plows and the horses would pull them and they would have to keep on and they would just have to hold on strong while that horse is moving so they can plant those seeds in some bad soil. They were trying to pull up the rocks and make the, the, the soil more fertile. Right. Well, using that same concept, um, God tells us in Hebrews, you need to hold on. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, what's the will of God? The will of God is not doing all these do's and don'ts. The will of God is clinging to Jesus. Okay, because God will do, he will work in you to do his perfect will. It's not you doing it. It's Christ. If you want to do God's will, you need to have a relationship with Jesus and you need to cling tightly to God. But here's the thing. You got to hold on and you need to persevere. Do not throw away your confidence in God. Because of all the things that are happening around you or things that are happening to you. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And he did promise that you are going to have um, a resurrection, a second coming, a new home in the kingdom. You will have the new earth. OK, all these former things will pass away. Your life in the sliver of eternity right now on this planet is just a line. OK, your 70 or 80 years on this planet is a line on the overall time scale of eternity. So don't lose it all because you can't hold on for that one line. Now, I love this picture because we have five Bengal cats. If you're not familiar with Bengals, Bengals are like little leopards. They're huge and they're very um, nocturnal and primal. But here's the thing. They're patient. When they want something, they'll sit there and they'll wait. And this cat, look at what he's doing. He'll wait there all day because he knows what's going to come out of that little hole is his dinner. OK, <laughs> if he if he gets impatient and he starts wandering away, that's probably when that mouse is going to come out. OK, so you just got to be steadfast and hold on 
know that there is a promise that God is going to sustain you. Okay, so that's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 36. Now, there's a lot of us who feel like this right now. We may not do this physically. Uh, we might do this physically in our bathroom, but mentally, this is where we are. We feel alone. We feel it's dark. Um, it feels like if there is any light, you have no access to it. I've talked to people who say, Pastor, when I pray, my, it seems like my prayers are just reaching the ceiling and God is not hearing. And I do want to let you know that it doesn't matter who you are and what you've done. God hears it all. Okay. You might think that your prayer is going to the ceiling. And if that is true, which it's not, but if it is true, remember that God is close to you and he's going to reach down through your roof and grab your prayer and take it back up to the head, uh, up to the throne room. So you might feel like this, but know that there is definitely hope. Okay, so let's take a look at my last text here, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And I don't like to say I saved the best for last because they're all really awesome. But in this case, I think that this is very hopeful. Okay, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Here's what it says. If you want, if you're dealing with frustration and, and you got family members and you got friends or neighbors that don't know where to go, don't know where to turn because the society's saying don't trust in anything. Okay, you need to share these texts with them. All right, don't take these, these pearls and hold them for yourself. Okay, think of what I just gave you as seeds. Write them in your Bibles, mark your Bibles, and then take them and share them with people who are going through these kinds of frustrations and, and discomforts, okay? Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. So some of us say, you know, we've been trying to do good. I've been trying to stay faithful to God, but it's getting it's getting tiresome and I don't see any results. You know, don't worry about the results. This is the number one cause of frustration today is because our measure of success is based on results. OK, we want to see the end. We want to see the end result. You know, we don't like giving money to homeless people because we watch them. And we see what they're going to do with it. Don't worry about what they do with it. That's not for you. What's for you is you having the heart to help. And you've done God's will. What they do with it, that's on them. Okay? But don't be weary in doing good. If there's stuff going on around you and you feel frustrated, you need to release a little bit and allow God to come in and say, listen, the measurement and the reward of what you're doing in good is going to come in the future. You may not see it now. You know, a lot of times we like to measure our success in our life up against the rich people, up against the houses and the cars they drive. Don't compare your houses or your cars or your status or any of the things that, that we often um, stay fixated on because it's all going to burn. I don't mean to be crass or anything, but come on. All the stuff that we hold on to on this planet, you know it's all going to go away. So how about... Stay focused on what's coming in the future, what God has promised. So don't be weary about doing good now because, because the result is there. You leave the result to God. You just plant the seed. God will cultivate it. He will bring it to fruition. And if you get the, the privilege of doing the reaping, praise the Lord. Okay, but don't look for the reaping. Just plant the seed, do the good, and don't be frustrated. Don't keep your eyes fixated on that people. Just keep your focus on Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit do the work, okay? And if God says, I want you to be a part of the reaping, then praise the Lord because you got to sow and you got to reap. Some of us get to reap and we didn't even sow. Okay, that's even a double praise the Lord. Okay, but don't take that for granted. Just go like liquid. You know, in the Sabbath school this morning, we talked about gold. You know, when it's melted down, you know, that hard, that hard gold substance is solid. This is how we are sometimes. But you melt it down to get the impurities out, and we're like what? We're liquid. you got to fluidly move around so God can put you into a mold. Some of us are going to be bricks of gold. Some of us will be swords of gold. But uh, here's the thing. We're all going to be gold. Well, maybe diamonds. That's a better thing. But, you know, you get my illustration there. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That's the problem. So many times God's people don't have patience we give up too soon and we say i don't see god working in my life i look like the same person i'm not getting any results there is a result but you just have to be patient and wait for it you know i took my um kids fishing several weeks ago and um 
it was awesome. It was the experience of going out there and fishing. But did we catch anything? No. Okay. And this was a perfect object lesson to my kids. Sometimes you have to wait and you have to wait for it. Well, guess what happened? We went out a second time. We we're closing out the day. We decided we would stop at one of those lakes up in Arizona. And um, my son, Karsten, he threw out a fishing pole and um, he was taken in and lo and behold, he caught his first fish. Man, he was patient. He endured. He, he wasn't weary, even though it was hot out there. We tried it for, for several days. We caught nothing. But in the proper time, my son, Karsten, he harvested what he reaped. And that was his patience, yielded a little bluegill. Now, did it matter that the bluegill was that big? <laughs> okay. I literally, it was like two inches big. Man, it, you would have thought that that fish was like a whale. It was like the biggest success for the entire family, not just Karsten. And he just, he was so excited to catch a two inch fish. Okay. Some of us are going to go fishing and we won't see the result until a future time. And we might be catching whales, okay, because we're in the end times. But here's the thing. Don't be frustrated. Follow these five guidelines and you can make it through these end times during the dark hours of depression, frustration, and anger. Know that there's a new day coming, that the dawn is coming and Jesus is coming back. Is this you right here? Are you one of these? You know, the people who are standing here who get to see Jesus come are people who are able to deal with their frustration. They were able to go to God's word and trust and rely. They were able to persevere and they were able to realize that God is still in control, that he would make the path straight, that God would able, if you're able to trust him, he will be able to keep you through this whole time. If this is you, if this is where you want to be, let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray for all those who are hearing my voice now. We pray for everyone who is joining me in this prayer, that we can turn all of our frustrations into victories, that we can come to you now, Lord, and turn over all of these um, measures of success that we place on ourselves and that we turn them to you and that we have trust and faith that you will give us the reward at the end of the day. Father, we look for that day when your coming will be... Um, will be and that we will be there and we know that that time is very near now we pray for this in jesus name amen amen okay everyone well thank you so much for joining me i wanted to just say shabbat shalom to everyone um if you um have not been able to follow in this bible text for the last day series you can go on the chandler media ministry site and download all of those videos or watch them over this one in particular these um series you might want to share with others because for those of you watching, these texts are probably nothing new. You've probably read them over and over again. But these are packaged in a way that you can share this with some family and friends that are dealing with some frustrations. Okay, um, This is a message for all people. It's not just for Christians. There is an answer, and the answer is God. The answer is Jesus, and you can find the answers in the Bible. The Bible might be an ancient scripture, a text, but it is just as relevant for 2020 and for the end times and ever before. So to this end, I want to say happy Sabbath to everyone and God bless. We'll see you all a little bit later. Bye.